Okay. Uh, right on time. All right. So let's start. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Saya. Uh, I'm a field engineer at uh, Solo.io. What we do is that we help um, with everything API gateways and, and, and service mesh. That's what I do in my work, though now I'm um, basically interested more into a deeper layer, okay? So historically, again, I work with anything, incoming traffic, ingress traffic to Kubernetes cluster, for example, or uh, service mesh technologies. But recently, you know, that's what operates if you look at the OCI model, we are talking about L7, you know, L7 type networking, right? Application networking. Um, but now I, I, I'm trying to learn more kind of the deeper network layer, so L3, L4, okay? This is just to optimize everything that is related to networking in general, and mostly regarding security and monitoring and things like that, okay? That's a bit of, about my background. Uh, again, first, thank you all for attending this session. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out uh, to me on Twitter, uh, dash uh, Asaya, or you can find me on LinkedIn, for example, okay? Um, so this is an interactive workshop. What we're gonna do uh, mostly is um, a quick introduction to what is, e what is eBPF, uh, what is XDP, and then uh, we are going to take a look at an, some examples of real world use cases that can be implemented tomorrow, if you guys want, uh, to implement some scenarios using XDP, okay? Um, it, this is really intro level. It's nothing technical, nothing too technical. It, there's some code to understand and to read, but there's nothing really crazy to, um, you know, it's really, I'm keeping it pretty, pretty basic. And again, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate. All right, so, First thing is, uh, what is eBPF? And I think I want to start with a question here in the audience. Who heard of eBPF before? Awesome, so most of you guys, awesome. Um, and who's using it in some, some kind? Are you guys using eBPF today? No, okay. Uh, and who heard of XDP? Okay, cool, all right, awesome. Okay, so what is eBPF, and why do I care about eBPF in this use case? Um, again, I was mentioning earlier that what I usually do is to deal with, um, you know, networking issues. And when we, talk in, when we talk about application networking, application networking, you have always some incoming traffic from a client, for example, to, to, uh, to a cluster, right? So we have, for example, your mobile phone calling out to a cluster on Kubernetes or things like that. And at that level, you think about more, you know, in terms of security and monitoring, you wanna monitor your traffic that comes, the ingress traffic coming to your cluster, um, and you wanna also do things like security, right? You wanna rate limit uh, based on an IP source or you wanna protect from the DDoS attacks and things like that, right? This is one of the most used cases most important use cases for anything related to to load balancing, for example, and just application networking, and that deals at, that operates usually at kind of the L4 uh, L L7 layer when we talk about application networking, but this can always be optimized, okay? Um, mostly because L7 is too late in the network, like, you know, in, in, on the stack. It means the application layer, I mean, everything got parsed, went through the network filters and all that stuff, meaning it's really uh, expensive, either from a resource standpoint or also from just, you know, a processing. It's too late. Some, if we can stop things earlier, it's always better. And this is why I'm interested in eBPF, because eBPF, the way it operates, um, just a quick reminder for, for everyone here, eBPF is a way for, for us to create programs that runs on the kernel, okay? So it runs directly in Linux, kernel, and you can interact with it uh, using uh, what we call a user space, 
program can interact with uh, you know a kernel space program so you create some code and you put that some code you attach it you know in your in your in your kernel and then you have your uh, user space application that interacts with it for example right so this is really cool why because um, then you can really look into things in the, on the kernel level like for example to either monitor you know, uh, and we attach to certain hooks and we can do things like monitoring or reshaping the traffic or alternating something, right? And that means that we don't wait until the application layer, which is too late. I do that super fast. I do that at the kernel kernel level. And that's that's awesome. So uh, if I want to create an eBPF program again, I'm going to write some eBPF code uh, for my kernel space. I, 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 I add that to my kernel and then have another, what we call like, if we take a look here, let's say I want to create an application that uh, monitor any type of traffic. Uh, I will create first um, an eBPF uh, program that will listen to hooks here. And some certain hooks are, for example, network uh, uh, or like network or, or file, file system functions. And based on that, I can report data Right, I can report data to my user space program that can, for example, create a Prometheus uh, function. Right, so this is cool. Um, or I can do it the other the other way around. So from a process perspective, here from a user space, I can create an application that will uh, transfer. Like let's say I'll say deny deny this call from this source to this target. Uh, this will go through the you know through what you call a map. Uh, so kind of a mechanism to send data from the user space to the kernel space. And then the eBPF program will get from the kernel space, will get the data and enforce a certain policy, right? This is, for example, for anything security related. So, and we're going to see an example um, of like kind of, especially more the kernel space mechanisms uh, today. So why eBPF? What would we care about the eBPF? I mentioned it earlier um, one of the important things is that uh, if I want to like monitor what's going on my on my um, on my machine, it is really useful to look at what's happening directly in the kernel instead of waiting for the user space layer. Right? Um, user space are consuming. It's too late. If I get if I can get the data faster right at the start from the kernel, that'd be awesome. And this is why we use uh, APPF mostly for monitoring. So. Uh, anything like traffic related, um, you know, like how, if, there is a, if there is a call from this place to another, how can I report it easily there and send it to user space to create like an, a Prometheus metric? So observability, again, is one of the most important uh, features that are, you know, that we, where we can use eBPF. And the other thing is networking um, and security in general. So. Networking can be like reshaping traffic, and that's what we're gonna see using the, the kind of the tutorial and the workshop today. Um, networking is really important, where we want to make decision on like the packets right at the start. Like, hey, well, well, now I want to send this traffic to this different host, or I want to deny access to this machine, or I want to I want to restrict uh, something or filter something, right? Anything related to networking it can actually get mixed a bit with security, where if if something happened, like you know, like something wrong happened on my machine, like uh, packets that sh are not supposed to be received, or uh, a function call that should not have been done, I can capture that using eBPF. I can make a decision there, saying, well, this is not per uh, permitted, this is denied, and then you can uh, secure your application right from the start without waiting all going all the way up to the application layer. Now, what is XDP? Uh, again, uh, ABPF is more like the kind of the umbrella term here, but XDP is more dedicated to how we can create things that are way earlier on our network uh, network stack. And XDP stands for Express Data Path. It's actually a Linux in uh, kernel fast path. Fast path. Um, it, it's basically programmable. Like we, you need compatibility from the driver, from the network, from, from the driver to be able to to use XDP. And what it means by that is like we are listening or actually in, interacting with the traffic way earlier. So we are talking about like driver here. So that is basically one of the first steps after the physical layer. 
right? Like the physical layer, you have the driver, and then you deal with all uh, your, you know, your, your other network uh, functionalities. So anything done there at XDP, this is really, really early, right? So in terms of security or routing or anything like that, this is perfect for us. And it can be used for a lot of use cases. And I mentioned earlier, like uh, anything related to security or anything related to load balancing, this is a perfect use case, right? Um, for security, for example, you want to make sure, like if you're dropping the packets right at the start, you are protecting your system 100%, like way better than waiting all the way to the application layer, because it's too late sometimes. Um, and for the load balancing, the same thing. If a load balance, um, you know, using XDP, it's super early, so meaning like you don't have to process packets er later on, so you don't have, you kind of save on processing time and things like that. All right, um, so if we think about the use case here, like the way we deal with like, uh, you know, a traditional way of dropping packets, like here is an example of like packet drop. I want to completely drop a specific packet. Um, if we're think, thinking about the kind of the network stack layer using NetFilter in this case, uh, you'll see that you have network stack, you have net, uh, NetFilter, and then you can drop your packet. So, but, but the thing is like, um, you know, the communication's already been here, went all the way to your driver, and now it's in your network stack, and then, well, it kind of, you know, basically if it's here for me, it's started to be too late. Um, so, now let's say, uh, let's say I want to improve this a bit, and we can talk about TC. TC is another way of up, like dealing with like um, traffic, right? Um, and it, this can be attached between, you know, um, let's say between the driver and the network stack. Here we can make a decision saying, well, drop the traffic. Uh, but it's still like went through the driver and like, you know, it, it's still, it's better than the network filter step, right, that we saw earlier. But it's, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit after the driver here. So we can optimize, it, optimize this better. Now, in terms of optimization, here's we're talking about the XDP in this case, right? XDP is definitely running at this stage here, right? So we are talking about like way too early, which is awesome. So now uh, a bad traffic is coming to my uh, network interface and going all the way to, to, my, I mean, to, to my driver. And here I can make decisions and say, well, now, well, you know, uh, drop that packet right there. You don't have to go anything like anywhere to the network stack. It's completely protecting your system. And that's what XDP can offer us for example, in the security, from a security aspect. But this can also apply for rerouting or uh, forwarding packets, right? In terms of load balancing, the driver itself can, can definitely like send traffic to a different uh, network interface or deal with traffic super early. Okay, um, now let's talk more about uh, use cases for like in terms of security. Um, in terms of security, XDP can be used to Here's some examples, right? This is not the full, this is not the full list, but this is kind of some ideas that I'm, uh, that you can work on. Uh, for example, you can restrict certain IPs, right? Certain sources. Um, that's, this is perfect for preventing the DOS attacks, for example, or just, uh, just restricting and putting network security or network uh, resiliency and uh, network, most, like mostly security, right? No, not resilience in this case, but mostly security. Um, to to protect a, a certain target uh, from a certain IPs, right? Uh, restricting protocols, that's also important. You know, like if you don't want to allow certain protocols to be used, let's say you have an application that is only TCP. Why would you care about having UDP, for example, right? So in this case, you can just create a filter that would restrict the traffic to only TCP, uh, TCP traffic. Um, other things like DDoS attacks, I think I mentioned it earlier, kind of a previous example. If DDoS is happening, you can you need to detect it early, and from there you can just you know obviously either packet uh, counting or or anything like that. You can make a decision saying, well, now drop this traffic. Uh, you know, prevention super early. This is awesome, and also that part of the DDoS uh, part. You can catch with any malicious packets or anything going on uh, that is not, for example, part of the TCP stack. You can just filter this out directly, and we're gonna see kind of examples of we're gonna see an example of uh, of this, and 
uh, well, probably probably more just keeping it basic when I see an example of restricting IPs. Okay, um, now in terms of security, there's a lot of tools out there that are taking advantage of this, okay? Uh, one of the important uh, blogs I, I found online, which is Cloudflare, right? Cloudflare is, um, is, is a solution for, um, you know, it helps you with like, basically providing your data faster. I think a lot of people know about their solutions. Um, they are using XDP to prevent uh, the US you know, attacks. And that's using their, directly their, you know, their mechanism where the, this layer here is the one protecting mostly the, the deploying rules, but their, their XDP layer is the one providing an extra layer of security here um, to save, you know, to prevent from DDoS attacks way early in the, in, in the chain. Um, now, XDP for, for routing, there's multiple use cases here that we can talk about. Um, but basically, in terms of routing, we can use XDP to, to forward traffic to a certain host directly or certain certain targets. Uh, we can route early, way too early, I showed you guys earlier. Uh, things for load balancing also, we can create load balancing policies or can, you know, uh, and we gonna see an example of the load balancing part. Um, you know, you can, you can do intelligent routing, so making decisions way early again. Um, this is not typical for any XDP, but you can do it there. And in performance, so this is really, perf like XDP, again, being super early is super performant. So, um, you know, if you look at XDP at Meta, um, they are using, uh, you know, a, a, new, a tool that they open source call uh, Ketron, and this is basically uh, their, their XDP tool to load balance faster. And they, they, are, they are saying that they gain a 10x, um, 10x performance over the, the previous generation of the load balancing just because they're using XDP. 10 times faster. This is awesome. This is pretty interesting technology to be used, especially load balancing hydrogen. Um, same thing for Cilium, right? Cilium mostly also use XDP, especially like on their um, on the uh, on the uh, north south type traffic, right? We can make decisions there uh, faster. We can uh, route traffic. Um, you know, it's it, it's way faster than than other type of technologies. I'm going to see a, a graph later. They don't use it. They don't. They see use TC for for the rest for the east west. Uh, but in in terms of like serum capabilities, XDP is used for for the forwarding traffic part. And you can see you can see the. Uh, the, the performance gain that they got from just using from using XDP. Um, first of all, who knows about Cilium here? Awesome, great. Uh, well, Cilium is a CNI for Kubernetes. Okay, it just allow you to uh, route traffic and and you know assign a, assign actually define policies and so network policies on on, on Kubernetes anything that would uh, a CNI would offer. Uh, so instead of the kind of the basic kube proxy that comes with, ex with, uh, with, with, um, with uh, Kubernetes directly, uh, we'll see that, we see that uh, kube proxy, and you see the, the difference here. Um, TC is also, TC is eBPF, but still you see that XDP in terms of gain, uh, the, the CPU um, optimization that got from from the traffic is, is, is just crazy. You see that there's not even comparison between, between a kube proxy here, like kube proxy that comes with, with Kubernetes directly and, and a Cilium based uh, XDP uh, forwarding, right? This is a term of like almost we're doing like uh, a triple here in terms of performance optimization. So this is why, yeah, and this is another kind of showing the same thing here. Uh, again, I'm, I'm taking that from the documentation of Cilium. Uh, you can see that you know L L4 load balancing using XDP. You see in terms of usage used here, and you see this APVS. It's just crazy. That just uh, we're talking about like I don't know 20 x here. Uh, that that's uh, that's definitely something to look into in terms of like traffic, right? Traffic load balancing things like that. Okay, so. This is, was basically the introduction to um, to XDP. Um, 
And we saw that can be used for security, can be used for load balancing. Now is actually the fun part of the workshop, I hope, of, the, of this session, is to do some hands-on and try to create some policies and actually try to use some small examples to replicate everything we talked about here. All right, so it's workshop time. Uh, again, uh, this workshop can be done on your laptops if you are interested, right? You have just to go on this uh, link and you're gonna be able to, uh, able to follow with me. Uh, if not, I can definitely, I'm just doing it, I'm gonna do it again in front of you here. Uh, and uh, if you wanna follow, that's fine. If you wanna uh, do this uh, workshop later, it's also an option. Uh, this link gonna be available for three days, right? Like if you guys wanna follow with me today and, and do the workshop on your own time, that's also another option. I'll completely up to you guys. All right, so I'm gonna start here. So first thing you have to do um, to get access to the workshop, just click on that link, uh, basically go to that again, uh, bit.ly xdp-tutorial. Uh, and uh, we're gonna get to this platform where you just click on uh, the link and go to intro to EBPF XDP. I'm gonna start, click on start track, okay? It's gonna take about two minutes to get things ready. So I'm gonna put back the link here uh, for you to, uh, to copy if, if you wanna start. Now, um, any question up to here regarding YXDP? Awesome, seems like I'm really clear like that. Plus it's five, pretty sure like, you know. Um, it's gonna take about two, wait a second. I'm going back to my workshop thing. This is the platform we use called Instruct. Um, again, also I'm, I'm gonna talk about, after this workshop, actually at the end of the workshop, I'm gonna talk about another, like an open source tool we use uh, called Bumblebee, okay? That's something that we are, we are working on and allow us to create eBPF programs easily. So this is an interesting thing to, to learn about if you are interested in creating eBPF programs. In the meantime, I can actually show you guys the, uh, if I do Bumblebee, this open source program called, uh, it's it, it definitely, I'm gonna show you an example later, but it helps you uh, create and package and push um, EPPF programs like you do with Docker, right? Like with Docker experience, for example, you build your, you, you build your Docker uh, container uh, image, you push it to a registry, and then from the registry you can use Docker to either pull that image or run it. It's kind of the same thing, the same experience you can have with Bumblebee where you can uh, create your EPPF program, you can build it, you can package it, you can put uh, put this into an OCI image so it can be persisted into a registry, like a Docker registry, and then you can pull it and run it. So it's really interesting uh, technology if you wanna reuse this within your company for other use cases, right? Imagine you create a good EPPF uh, program that someone else can take advantage of. You're just gonna put it into the, uh, um, you know, kind of the OCI image. You give him a link the same way you give like a Docker image link, someone to pull and to run. Okay, so uh, it's still taking time. Great, good timing. All right, let's start. Let's get started here. Uh, again, this environment can be, can be available for three days. If you want to do this uh, workshop later, uh, don't hesitate. If you wanna do it now, again, that's an option too. All right, so here's the environments we're gonna work with. Um, the environments we are working with here is just a doc, some Docker containers, okay? I have uh, five, sorry. I have like a couple Docker containers, if I take a look here. I have a router, which basically the router is kind of the pod where I'm gonna run all my eBPF code, my XDP code, okay? That's kind of, think about it as the load balancer pod. And that's mostly just for testing. I have an, a client I call the restricted client. 
um, and I have another client, just client. And just the same thing, uh, they have like curl, they have ping and ping six for a, uh, IPv6 uh, pinging. And then you have uh, target A and target B, there are just services that return like a 200 with like a message saying, hey, I'm like target B service. And a registry, which is a Docker registry. No, nothing, nothing crazy, just Docker registry. Oh, connection closed, what's happening here? Let me refresh. All right. So let's yeah let's start. I think uh, so. Let's let's take an example. Let's uh, start playing with my my components here. Um, here, if I make a call from uh, the like if you see here, I'm doing a uh, a call a ping. I'm 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 uh, pinging the uh, router address. So this is the IP of the router, and I'm doing uh, a, a ping of that address from the client pod. So the client is doing a ping to the router pod. If you do this, you will see that it works fine. I'm getting um, response back from my router, so the client is able to talk to the router. All right. Um, now, let's actually do the same thing, the exact same thing this time. Though, if you guys see the difference, if they, this time we're using ping 6. Okay, so ping normal, uh, just ping, is using IPv4. So it's using the IP, uh, IPv4 version like, of, of the, of the uh, router pod. Uh, ping 6 is using uh, ping, but using the IPv6 address of the router pod. Okay, that's the only difference. This time I'm going to make a call. Awesome, I'm getting data back from the router. Uh, calling from, you know, the client can ping using IPv6 or IPv4, the router pod, which is awesome. All right, so first, this example here is about traffic filtering, okay? So what I'm, what I'm going to use XDP for in this example, let's say I want to write some code to not allow any IPv6 traffic. And there's a strict and actually filter it to only let AP, uh, IPv4 uh, traffic go into my router pod. So when I ping, I'm expecting pings to work, but not ping six. So let's do this. Let's create some code to enforce this policy. Um, so let's start here. I'm gonna just start by creating a, an empty file. Um, and again, if you guys wanna see the configuration, you can click on configuration here. All the code you're gonna do will be here. Um, let's let's create the first step of like creating like an eBPF program. Uh, first thing I wanna do is to include some. Uh, actually, I can't even like yeah. I'm gonna use the C formatting. So yeah, the first thing I wanna do is just include some dependencies. They're all they're not all needed right now. I'm just adding them like because I'm going to need them later, like in other in other uh, examples. These are usually, especially like the BPF helper and um, BPF, BPF, are useful for allowing us to give fun functions to to deal with you know our EPPF uh, traffic, uh, EPPF uh, functions. So this is the first step here, just adding dependencies. Nothing important. Now. Let's say I want to actually this time, well, step two, this, this time I'm going to start actually writing my, an XDP, uh, an XDP, some XDP code. Running the same command here, so this time I'm just going to reopen it because there's a, a problem when, when I uh, modify file. So here, here uh, I'm going to start writing uh, X, an XDP Actually, an ABPF program. And if you guys wrote an ABPF program, you know that you need uh, uh, the, the uh, sec uh, macro. It's just to play, place like, actually the, uh, the, the program into, you know, um, LFPF. It's not, not super important, but actually it's important when you deal with maps. And, uh, but for, for function uh, calls, it's not going to be uh, 
Super Bowl. So just give it like a, a name that you would, uh, you know, distinguish how, you know, your APPO program. Again, not, not a really crazy step here. Um, now let's actually now let's start creating like an ABPF like an XDP program. XDP actually has multiple uh, packet uh, options. Like uh, uh, a packet drop would, uh, you know, if I, you know, the, to write an XDP program in ABPF is just a function that you know return int. And this int is representing one of the this following functions. Either XDP drop, XDP drop mean drop the packet. Okay, if I'm returning, if I return the XDP drop, meaning uh, traffic needs to be dropped. Uh, XDP pass means just like hey, let's this traffic go through. That's fine. Um, XDP TX is forward the packet to the same network interface, so it's going back to the network interface. Um, but actually, you can modify it. Uh, XDP redirect. To it's actually direct the network through another uh, NIC, and um, XDP aborted. Uh, that's definitely if there is an is issue, we want to just like do an abort. Usually, we don't recommend we don't recommend using this uh, XDP uh, aborted. So the first the first XDP program we're going to create right now using is going to use XDP drop. And we want to let's say we're going to create an application that drops all the traffic going to that specific uh, host. For that, we're gonna just run run this this command here, just to get the code for for the step three, which is uh, yeah, which is here, and you guys see, right? The creation of an XDP, the, some XDP code here is pretty straightforward. Uh, again, it's like a uh, function that returns an int. It's gonna take the connection as parameter, and it's you can use well this function here is BPF program just. Uh, Maybe a function just to to print some uh, in any data you want, uh, but here the important thing is like just returning XDP drop, right? So this XDP drop means that everything going through this filter will be dropped, any type of traffic. So here's the basic a uh, basic XDP function. All right. Definitely something else. Okay, so we're not going to run this command like uh, this this um, XDP uh, filter yet. Let's do another one. This time, let's create. Actually, you know, we're going to run the step four of my code. Instead of dropping everything, I said I want to drop only IPv6 traffic. Okay, I want to allow uh, my IPv4 traffic to still go through. And here it is. Remove here. I'm just gonna open it again. So you see here, this function is more, kind of more advanced than the one we saw earlier. Um, this time we're doing more, a bit more logic. Uh, it's getting a bit more complicated, but it's still simple to understand. So here, this function, again, it's in the, you know, XDP returning an int. Um, the first part we're doing is we are parsing ETAs, you know, our Ethernet, um, our TCP IP uh, uh, packet, and then actually we can, if we, you can, if we can parse that packet, you know, if we know that's like a valid packet, then we can uh, process it. If, if, if there's a problem like parsing it, meaning like there's a problem with the traffic, which is, which is just that way we're turning uh, an XDP abort. Again, this is just to verify that the packet is valid. So this is kind of a type of filtering. Through this, through this uh, code, this would make, that just means that if, if uh, again, if the traffic is valid, let it through. If not, drop it. Actually abort it, which is, again, a sign of, of something bad happening. Again, I mentioned that we have a lot of uh, function helpers, and this time I'm using uh, BPF and TRC. This time, I'm using this function to just va validate that if, you know, if the uh, header proto on the ETH is, is not IPv6, okay? So if it's not IPv6, let it go through, right? XDP pass, meaning let the traffic go through. Well, if it's not this, meaning it's actually 
uh, IPv6, this case, drop it, okay? Again, this function is pretty straightforward. If it's not IPv6, let it go through. If it's IPv6, drop it. Okay, awesome. Let's run this function. To do this, I'm just gonna, I, I have already a make file that compiles the code. I'm just gonna compile this, traf, uh, this, this file called xdpc, which is under dist, okay? And for this, it's pretty straightforward. Already packaged everything, right? Um, and I'm gonna run it here. So here, there you go. If you see, this one here, it's, it's basically I'm just running a, a CLang to, to build my XDP program, and I'm using a BPF tool to attach to network interface ETH0, okay? Um, nothing crazy, nothing complicated. Again, I have an example here if you guys wanna copy it to do it on your own. Uh, that's also an option, but here it is. Now we are actually running that XDP program I showed you earlier to restrict traffic to only IPv6, to only IPv4 traffic, and removing, uh, filtering out only all the IPv6 uh, type traffic. Meaning, now if I do the test again, like I did earlier, if you remember the start of my, of my workshop, um, I tested the calls using, uh, I made a call using a, uh, ping and ping six, so let's do the same thing, okay? So if we do the same thing here, let's say I'm gonna make a call um, to my, from, so from the client to the router, so the, again, the router is the, router is the pod where, uh, is the container where the EPPF program is running. Now, if I'm doing a call from the client to the, to the router, we see that IPv4 traffic is good. Okay, so again, this is awesome. Now, what about IPv6? If I do this call, which is, you know, this time you see that I'm, I'm getting the IPv6 address of the router, and I'm calling the client, uh, from the client I'm doing a ping six to the router address. If I run this, you see that I'm getting destination unreachable, okay? Again, the simple program we created earlier completely filtered out my IPv6 traffic. So my pod, the router now, allow only IB, IPv4 type traffic, okay? Awesome, so this is a quick, simple example of how we can use XDP to filter traffic super early on the filter, uh, on, on, uh, on the filter chain, all right? All right, so first example, pretty easy, filtering out all IPv6 traffic. Let's take a look at another example. So, first time, uh, yeah, first lab was filtering. Now we're gonna take a look at restricting. So, what I mean by restricting is to use XDP to deny traffic from a certain source. This is really important if you wanna prevent like any DDoS type attack. Imagine you have a lot of packets coming to a destination. You wanna reduce the impact, you wanna secure your, 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 your uh, your target, then you can use an XDP, um, XDP filter for that. And in this example, I have two, um, I have two containers, uh, which is client, again, if you remember, I'm gonna do a Docker PS here, just for you guys to remember. Um, you see I have, Two containers, one called restricted client and one called client. I don't know if it's visible there uh, from the back, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I want to restrict the traffic coming from restricted client, okay? I want restricted client to not be able to talk to my router, but I want my client to still be able to talk to it, okay? So, first step is just to test that everything works fine. Now, if I actually make a, um, sorry, let me copy this. And let's say I run it here. Here is an example where we see that basically I can call again uh, from my client, from this client, I can call my router. This is good. This is good. Now, if I want to do, a, if I want to make a call from my restricted client, oh, it is working, right? So. 
that's going to be a scenario where you want to like whitelist or blacklist certain IPs. And you see in this case, my restricted client is still uh, is still able to talk to my to my router endpoint. So this is not good. What I'm gonna what I'm, I will do right now, I'm gonna create an XDP filter to completely restrict traffic from a certain IP. And for this, I'm going to let's let's start here by just copying the right files. And if we go back to my configuration, uh, the only difference now is that we're using XDPH2 for my dependencies, so it's kind of lightweight now on my XDP.C. Uh, if take a look at the code, um, I'm actually you know right now I'm. I found this example like, uh, for the IP address online, which is awesome, but uh, here, here's the thing. Um, the client is, you know, we define the client to be 172.17.0.14. That basically, um, that's, that's basically how Docker is assigning my IPs. This is the real IP, that's the IP of my client. And this is the IP of the restricted client. Okay, 172.17.05. Now let's take let's write some code to kind of restrict the the, the client uh, restricted client actually. So again, this is the exact same code as earlier, right? Um, and now I'm going to add my logic. So for this, I'm going to run this command here. Going back to my terminal just to get the new code. Step two, I'll go back to my configuration. Um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't update easily, so I'm gonna have to open it again. Um, yeah, so now you see the only the new step I have here is that I'm, I'm parsing my IPH, uh, you know, like just to get the IP header information, okay? Um, the same way we kind of parsed the packs earlier, this time I'm just verifying that can, you know, I can get the IP address of that specific source. Um, now we can have make some logic, you know, we can create some logic here around restricting a specific IP. And for that, I'm gonna run this command. I'm gonna actually, you know, get the new code for step three. And here's the logic. Here's how I can restrict certain IPs using uh, uh, XDP. Um, oops, open the right wrong file. So here you can see that now, um, where is it? Actually not yet. I'm gonna close this one. Just close this one, opening this one again. Yeah, here's the logic, right? So I'm, I'm checking if my address, you know, the source address from my packets, if it's equal to the address of the restricted client, right, then drop it. I don't want the traffic from that, you know, from that bad client. Think about that as like, not only rate limiting, but let's say, you know, geographic areas that you don't want your traffic from, or just within the same, you know, the same infrastructure, let's say all your internal traffic coming from a specific VPN address need to come through, but not all the other traffic. If you're using XDP in this case, you can drop traffic way early, okay? Then you're gonna secure, your, instead of using all the way up to a gateway to do this, your actually network itself is filtering out specific uh, traffic. And if it's not the client, it's not the client that's uh, like a restricted client, then just let the traffic go through, okay? So here we go, go back to this, and let's actually, now that we have the code, let's, let's actually run it. So I'm gonna ra uh, run this command. This actually, they're actually gonna detach the old uh, code we had earlier, and gonna attach the new one to uh, my to my ETH uh, zero interface. All right, let's make some calls like here. Let's take a look at the same thing we did earlier. Let's make a call here. Here's, you know, I'm making a call back to, uh, from, from my uh, client 
to my IPv4 router uh, pod. And you see that the client itself is still working, right? It's good. That's because the traffic is coming from the client. Now let's take a look at the restricted client. All right, so for the restricted client, I'll make a call here, you see it's not returning anything, which is awesome. That's what we want. Now, using basically XDP, we restricted traffic from a specific destination from the restricted client pod, uh, container. So the container restricted, restricted client cannot talk to my router pod uh, container, which is awesome. So again, second scenario, if you remember in my, you know, the presentation earlier, I was talking about XDP can be used for multiple use cases. I was talking about filtering and security, and this is a quick example how XDP can be used for these two use cases, okay? Now, the other thing I was talking about is load balancing and packet forwarding uh, aspect of XDP. So let's take an example of load balancing, okay? So this time, we are going to a load balance using XDP between two different targets. Uh, so for this, let's, take, let's go to the next lab. and uh, take a look at this load balancing example. Again, I found, I found most of this example online. I kind of modified it to, to fit this, uh, this workshop. There's a lot of material out there that can be reused. Uh, if you want to learn XDP, there's great material, uh, like XDP tutorial. This, uh, this repo here has a ton of examples. So if you go back here, there's like a couple examples that you can just follow to, to learn more about how XDP can be used to do for monitoring or tracing or redirecting or filtering and so on. So, okay, uh, that's good material. There's a lot of, there's some examples on the Cilium website too. Um, there's some good talks. Uh, like for example, the load balancing uh, from, from Liz Rice uh, was really interesting to me too if you wanna learn uh, more things on, on that. Uh, from actually, you know, back and forwarding and stuff like that. Let's going back to, to my example. Um, now, let's actually create an XDP filter that load balance between two different targets. And first thing we're gonna do is to just uh, see how is an action response from my, from my client. If I'm talking, if I'm talking, if the client is calling to the, the target app, if you guys remember also here, uh, doc, uh, okay, sorry, Docker, yes. So if you see here, I have, again, I have my client and so on, but I have also my target A and target B. And this is what the response I get from target A if I'm calling the target A service. I get uh, just the IP uh, of the server and I get a kind of a server, server name here. And if I do that for target B, I'm gonna get target B instead. And uh, that's pretty basic, it's just a simple example here. And the goal of this example is to call the router, and when I call the router, it should load balance between target A and target B. Kind of a, kind of a road, uh, around robin, um, probabilistic round robin approach. All right, so let's start. First step is to, um, well, get the code for DXDPC. Going back here, uh, C++. Sorry, CSS, what's that? No, uh, C++. All right, so the only difference this time, again, it's kind of for using the same code I, I showed you earlier. Um, this time, I'm actually defining multiple more IPs. I'm defining the target um, B and uh, target A and target B addresses, right? Again, in addition with our router, in addition with the clients. So it's kind of for using the same mechanism we saw all the way here, right? Nothing crazy, going all the way down here. Um, so that's the same code. Just, again, defining just these two, uh, this, this two new addresses here. All right, let's write some code now. The next step is to go to, let's add some logic around, um, you know, around load balancing. So here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the logic. If 
Again, you know, the same mechanism we used through like detect an IP earlier and restrict it, we can use the same thing. And we can say, well, if the, if the packet is coming from the, the source address from the client, then uh, send that traffic where destination address is going to be the address of a specific backend, right? And the backend in this case, I'm either picking backend A or backend B uh, like 50% of the time. Like, you know, we have a 50%, I'm using this um, uh, PPF, K time, get NS, to just like randomize the fact that 50% of the time is going to be uh, backend A and almost 50% of the time going to be uh, backend B. All right, uh, so that's the logic, and then when I get, you know, make a decision, I'm, I'm just gonna switch either back in A or back in B, and then I'm gonna use that address uh, for my destination address for the packets, okay? So I have my source address is the client, my destination address is uh, the IP of the, you know, this, this back end pod uh, containers, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, the thing is, uh, yeah, also uh, for the header destination, I'm going to keep the same thing. Now, the the traffic coming back, right? If I, if I get the traffic back to the router, I want to make sure that the the destination, right, the destination of the of the uh, the packet needs to go back to the client, not just stop at the router, right? So this is the kind of the other part of it. Um, once the call is made all the way to the target. Uh, that's that's good. This is the load balancing part. And then if the packet is coming back, it's going back to the client, right? It's not coming back to the router. So in this case, uh, that's the logic here. Destination address again of the packet is not the router, but it's actually the IP client, uh, the uh, the IP of the client. And also, the source address this time is going to be you know the router. Um, and uh, sometimes you know in IP you need uh, the checksum. I don't get too. I don't want to get this too too much. Uh, technical, I don't get the aspect there to understand the, the different components. But here, here's the logic is easy. Again, client calling the router uh, to an load balance between target A and target B. Response coming back to, uh, going to need to go back to, to the client itself. All right, let's run this code. Awesome. So if I do this, oh, well, it's kind of the same thing, but. Let's run the one we just wrote, actually. All right, so now I have that code that I just wrote, uh, I sh showed you now, attached to my uh, ETH0 interface. All right, moment of the truth now. Let's take a look at an example. And there you go. So you see here, first call, we made it through, went all the way to target A. Okay, cool. So actually, we're calling the router. You may, you guys see that where the client is not calling the target uh, endpoint directly. It's calling the, the client is talking to the router pod uh, container, and the router is load balancing directing traffic all the way to client A, which is which is great. That's what we are looking for. Now, let's actually do. Uh, make another call again, and we see it's target B this time. You see? So again, if, if I do the calls, A, we see B, we see A, we see B, A again, B. You see now, we easily created a load balancer that is forwarding traffic straight to my target destinations. And that's one of the power of XDP. Using just a couple line of code, we were able to direct traffic all the way down to the destination. Cool, awesome. So now here's a couple problems we have. Here's a couple problems we have with this, uh, with this code. And actually all, everything I showed you earlier uh, today. Um, we wrote um, only the user space, um, the, the kernel space program. We just wrote the logic that is driving my, my network stack. But we didn't create any user space program to inter interact with, with that code. Um, and this is really important because, look, if you go back to the configuration here, or just take an example of, of the data is coming back, or actually we're making decision based on, you see here we actually 
uh, statically define the address of the client, the router, the backend A, and backend B, um, which is not good, right? This is not a kind of a, it's not the use case that you will see out there. Uh, the use case you will see is that there's a dynamic process that would, that would find these IPs and send them back to the kernel uh, space program to make decision based on, right? So this should not be defined this way. It should be a user space program that gets the IPs or get the data or get whatever you want to do and be pushed down to the user, to the kernel space uh, program, and here we can make the logic. Now, in terms of communication between user space and, and kernel space, then you need, um, we need uh, basically what we call maps, right? Um, the way it works in, in eBPF in general, um, if we take a look at, I don't know if I have here any, let's see if I have a map here. Yeah, like, let's take a look at uh, this example here. Uh, the way it works in, in XDP or in eBPF in general, again, you're going to write some code, like, for example, uh, your kernel code. And here's, the, here's for example, the, the kernel. Uh, no, this, this, no, actually, this is good. This is the user space program. But um, let's go back to my, to my example. So he's, here's, here's an example of like a kernel, a kernel code. That's actually the same thing we kind of did today, right? We are uh, using, uh, using this XTP function to do something. Um, but the, import, the important part here is that to send data to the user space program, we use maps, right? So the way you define a map is just a struct. Uh, you define uh, your, your keys, your values definition, uh, the max entries, the type of it. There's multiple types. You can have like uh, a per CPU map. You can have like a, a ring hash and all that. So there's a different type of like maps you can use. Um, and once you define your map, you can interact with it and you can just push data into it. And there's multiple. I don't want to get into details here. There's a way to look for an element if, if it exists in your map. There's a way to push data into your map. And the way it, it happens is that you can, this is bi-directional, so basically you can go to, to use user space program. So going back to my examples here, and if I go back to my, uh, uh, well, my user space program was this one. And here you can write all the code you want, right? You can actually create the, uh, like here you see the options that are, can pass to your application. And if you think about the XDP example I showed you earlier, you can write your own code that will find the IPs of the clients or find the logic you want to do and be pushed down to, to your map. And then the, or from the other side, from the kernel space, you can get from the, yeah, from the kernel program, you can get the, the data from, the, for example, the IPs of the clients or things you want to restrict. Imagine I'm going to create an application that says, uh, I don't know, stop traffic by IP, right? I want to create this application. The way I'm going to do it, I'm going to do the same thing I showed you in lab two, where I'm going to have this process to like uh, find an IP and basically restrict based on it. But I'm also going to create like a user space program where I'm going to define the logic saying, well, you know, if I'm calling this uh, stop traffic by IP space, this specific IP, this IP is going to be passed down all the way using the map, to the kernel space uh, from the user space. And based on that data, I can restrict a specific target, right? So this is really important in, in that logic. So user space is important. Um, a map is, again, what is used to do this communication between a user space and kernel space. Now the problem is, the problem is like you see here, like hey, this is like a super basic example, right? Basic one, but you see that it gets pretty complicated to do user space programming and then kernel space programming. And if you want to do something easy, that doesn't help you, right? Um, most of the time, I mean, you guys noticed, like most of the time, sometimes you, you want to create some a quick logic to attach like an XDP program without having to care first about the user space. Maybe you don't have to write this code. Or actually, you just want to like have an easy way to to package it, to push it, to, to dockerize, to container, put it in a container, um, put it in OCI image, and pull it down and run it. Kind of what I was talking about earlier using Bumblebee. So again, Bumblebee is an open source project that helps you create XD, um, eBPF programs easy, 
okay, easily. And we'll take a look at how we can, uh, we'll use Bumblebee to create an, uh, a small EPPF program and what's the advantage we have compared to kind of the approach we are taking right now. Let's go back to my tutorial and I'm just gonna go to the next lab. Here is, uh, we're setting up the new lab for Bumblebee. And again, I'm gonna show you the, uh, the repo here if you wanna learn more about it, okay? Uh, it's, um, it gives you, again, it gives you kind of the same way you deal with um, the same way you deal with like a Docker, Docker, a Docker image, right? Docker image, what you do, again, you have a manifest, we have a file, whatever, you're building your uh, image, and then you are pushing it somewhere to a certain registry, and then you can pull it, you can run it, right? It's easy, makes your life easier and all that stuff, and you can also share that specific container, a specific image with someone else in your company to take advantage of. Same thing with XD, uh, same thing with EPPF using Bumblebee, right? You can build your code, you can package it, you can push it in the registry, then you can have that shared to other colleagues or internal users, pull that, and they can run it in their uh, Kubernetes, or they can run it in their, you know, just on their machine directly. There's multiple use cases there you can take advantage of, and I invite you to, to uh, dig into it. Now, Let's take an example of like a small, how we can do it with, with Mumblebee and see how, how it, it's way faster. So here you go. Um, first, I can just install Mumblebee. So now I have B installed, like just, oh, sorry. I can make it bigger because it's kind of harder to read. So there you go. Um, so yeah, so now I have B installed and what I can do is I can do just uh, be in it, right? So, uh, so again, oh, oops. So B, oh, oops. It's like it's like five now. Oh, almost six. Stopped working. Um, again, be in is gonna create my eBPF program for stack. Then I can select what kind of language I want to use. I'm obviously now. Only thing supported to C, though you know there's options to start looking into uh, um, other other technologies um, that would support this. Now, what type of like program I want to create? Let's say I want to create like a network network uh, type program, or I want to create like a, a file system one. Like file system, obviously you can create eBPF programs to like watch who's doing something on your machine and just like either report on it or block it, stuff like that, right? So in this case, I, let's say I want to do a network one. You can do network, and then uh, again, I talked about maps, right? I talked about a way to like send data from the kernel to the uh, kind of bi-directional way to send data from a user space a program to a kernel space program or vice versa, right? So in this case, you can select type of map you want to use. Uh, in this case, the two options we have are either ring buffer or hash map. I'd say I want to just start with like a, uh, well, I don't know, a ring buffer for this use case. And then you can, uh, you know, create kind of a counter. And this is important because certain, certain programs don't really need like a complicated user space program. You just need some sort of reporting, and maybe you need some sort of way to like create like a Prometheus metrics, all right? Like to monitor something. Um, well, here we can say, well, I don't know. I just want to print, and then you can give it an example. I don't know. Uh, let's say just foo.c. I don't care at this point. Just like I want to show you an example, right? Now. Okay, this is easy, but let's say I want to just start with like a real a real use case program, right? Um, you know, let's say I want to create the following. So let's see if I can open it here. Let's say I want to start with the uh, TCP connect, right? So, oh, well, this is crazy to look at in this, uh, this font. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail, but this is this is part of the libbpf tool, right? This is like a, uh, an open source project. You can look at it here, pf tool. Um, and it has a lot of examples here, right? You can take a look at any example you want. This is kind of the things that you would, you know, they're already there, like for example, you know, I know the TCP dump or 
um, in this example here, we're looking at uh, TCP Connect, right? So again, TCP Connect. So TCP Connect is an eBPF program in this case that also have a user, a user, a user space program to interact with. It has a, a user, a kernel space program that actually just counts the TCP connections. So every time something happens between the source and the, uh, in the destination, it somehow reports it to the user space. It's pretty complicated to look into. Uh, I don't want to really bore you guys with all the all the data here and how uh, how we create this. But you know, you just need to know that it's kind of pretty complicated, especially like you know, even like for the user space program. Imagine all this code to write. Now, let's take this example and just make it so easy with with Bumblebee. So again, I just grabbed only the kernel space program. That's it. Just TCP connect.c, which is the kernel space program, no user space. I only care about this. Now, TCP connect.c is here. I can build it using uh, Bumblebee. Again, just B build TCP connect.c. Again, kernel space program. And actually, I'm going to give it like the same way you do like a Docker build. You know, do a dash T and give it like a, uh, a Docker like a Docker uh, uh, registry address, kind of the same thing. Here, I have already a Docker registry running, or actually can be any, any type of registry. Um, again, and I'm actually just calling it TCP Connect V1. That's it. I'm going to run Bumblebee. That's going to build my application and uh, build my you know, EPPF program into an OCI image. Which is great. It's kind of the same thing when you do like a, a Docker build dash t dot, right? Uh, it's compiling the ABPF program. It's going to verify it if it's good, uh, and, and all the fun things you expect from a tool that will simplify your life. All right. So now we have an image. Awesome. I have this local image, uh, local host five thousand solo to TCP connect v one. Again, as I said, the same thing like you do with Docker. You can do v push uh, of that specific image to your registry, and this is actually pushing it to the local registry we have we have uh, running on my on my machine. But this can be uh, your I don't know any registry you have the same way any OCI compatible registry. Like if you think about Docker, uh, this is an OCI. There's Harbor. There's multiple ones. All right, now that I have my registry, uh, I have my, my image in my registry, then it just matter of doing like a B run. That's it. The same way you do Docker run, right, of an image. There you go. It's going to pull the image and going to run it. Sweet. Now I can just make calls like, you know, let's take an example of the, um, I don't know, if I do, I don't know, like any, any curl. Or, you know, if I do curl google.com, automatically going to register my destination address and my source address. So this is my machine calling out to my destination, to destination address, which is the, the, Google, the Google servers. And I can actually even, like, if you take a look at the, uh, you know, Docker exec client, like the, what we did earlier, like if I do the Docker exec uh, client, so the client's calling to my, my router. If you see, I'm getting back to, again, that's kind of the load balancer we were looking at earlier. And you can see here, if you go back to terminal, you can see the address. You can see that now, um, actually, every time I'm making a call, it is captured and automatically, uh, you know, incrementing my counter saying, well, this is basically, this is the address. You know, this, oh, I don't know how to remove this thing. Yeah, you see here, 172, uh, 1704, that's the IP client. Uh, IP of the uh, of the client and it's talking to the router, which is ends with six, right? And again, also things you can see is that now that my if B is running like B, uh, Bumblebee, you can also make a call to the metrics or automatically generates metrics for you uh, that you can you know that's Prometheus compatible metrics that can be pushed to create dashboards or do signaling or do like uh, alerting or anything that goes with it, right? So basically in this case, we have 
an easy way to get metrics saying, well, this time, you know, this address called this address three times. And if you guys noticed, I get all this without even like creating any anything in my uh, for my user space. So if I go back to my to my example, I didn't write any of this like all this user space program to do this logic completely abstracted to you. So it speed up completely your you know development of ABPF programs. Um, and to make it easier to, again, package, um, uh, push to registries, share, and all the things you can do with. All right, so I did the workshop in an hour 10, which is great for a, a long day. I know you guys are tired, and especially looking at EBPF and code at, at six is, is no fun here. So yeah, again, um, Thank you uh, for for joining this session. That was really, um, I know that was hard to, to to you know to stay for this session, but really thank you for for this, and uh, hope to see you soon. Do you have any questions? Oh, thank you for your presentations. Um, you said that um, we can improve the network networking performances by using ABPF and XDP. So um, could it happen in the future that uh, the legacy networking stacks, that networking stacks in Linux will be no longer used and uh, ABPF, ABPF and XDP will be used as a default? Uh, yeah, great question. So basically, uh, what the legacy, if the legacy things will, will get out from the picture. Um, yeah, I mean, the replacement is there. ABPF, XDP is progressing a lot, and we see that as a not, I don't think it's gonna be mainstream like replacement of one. Like you still need your, you know, your, your physical layer. You still need that. Uh, I think the, the cool thing that we see right now, specifically with XDP, we see that the, uh, the code, the kernel is getting closer to kind of the physical layer and the way they interact with each other. Through XDP, for example, right? Uh, like now XDP interact di directly with the driver, right? So I'm assuming in the future, the way we're gonna see, we're gonna see, we're gonna see more upon standard that maybe even gonna go, I don't know, I don't think we can go any any further, but this kind of two layers are, are easily uh, uh, merged together into like an inter interface that users like me and you can interfere with and, and post. So maybe not today, but yeah, in the future, we're gonna see more XDP being, you know, XDP and anything related being kind of a mainstream thing. Yeah. All right. Again, thank you, everybody. Um, I guess time to to rest, right? <laughs> that was a long day for you guys. Thank you.